As far as making my own art, um, I have to do it. I wouldn't be able to do the science without it. For me, it's like a whole cycle. I do the science, you know, I ask a question, I see something, I want to ask a question, I do the science, but then I have to kind of express what it's like to go through that process and that process of working with people along the way and working with animals in the wild and in these landscapes. And then, then when the art's coming out, it inspires other questions for science. So I start thinking about the science. So it's a whole cycle. I wouldn't be able to do one without the other. And so it's really, uh, for me, like um, part of the whole system. And the con I wouldn't say the conclusion, but it's like the conclusion that leads to the next question. And then it keeps going and going and going. I'm a professional biologist, and when I'm doing science, I have to be very methodological and, and create um, research that then other people can replicate. But then when I'm creating art, it allows me to explore a different emotive side and um, a side of self-expression and, and allowing me to speculate as well. Most of the works are very personal because they're, they're kind of all my, my way of expressing myself to the world around me and the way that I see the world changing. I wanted to somehow take this idea of all these other issues, biodiversity, what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico, what's happening with frogs, what's happening with birds, and insects, um, and landscape changes, and how we're part of that, how we're part of this biological community. And any of us that's been born since the Industrial Revolution, we have chemicals from industry. Um, some of which are naturally occurring, but a lot of them are just artificial chemicals like radiation, radionuclide materials that are found in our baby teeth from drinking milk after the above ground nuclear testing in the 1950s and 60s. So I try to think of a way that I could present this as a self portrait. And I had my blood drawn. I felt it was the way that I needed to somehow, again, identify myself as a biological organism alive at this moment in history, contaminated with some of these chemicals. So based on the feedback I was getting from some of those tests, I then tried to find some of those chemicals, uh, industrial pollutants, and I mixed them with my blood, uh, and I did these finger portraits. So each one I had myself fingerprinted, um, and then I blew up each fingerprint, and then using sumi brushes um, under a giant uh, hood so that I wouldn't expose myself to any more of the chemicals, I did these kind of sumi ink paintings of each one of my fingerprints. So in a sense, I mean, they're, they're very painterly, they're very graphic, um, but I'm hoping that they're also, there's a, there's a kind of sensibility to them where each of us could look at them and say, wow, that's me too. When creating the work, I'm really thinking about um, making artistic decisions about aesthetic and form and, and the push and pull, but I'm also thinking about beauty and atrocity even, um, that, that push and pull between seeing something beautiful but then realizing what you're actually looking at is, is oftentimes tragic. So with a greater exhibition, how do we kind of show that? As we kind of walk through the exhibition, you can see just this kind of loss of these beautiful forms. One of the oldest bodies of work, and there are several pieces from that series here, is called um, MALAMP, which basically stands for the Malformed Amphibian Project. In the middle 1990s, when I was still an art student and taking science classes, um, there seemed to be a plague of deformed frogs happening, uh, mostly initially in the Midwest, in Minnesota, but then reports started to come in from all over the U.S. So I ended up volunteering with the USGS to, to help on surveys looking for deformed frogs and eventually helping to coordinate surveys and then later working in a laboratory part-time and it just kind of really congealed into um, this long-term project that I'm still kind of working on. I'm still doing amphibian surveys. So um, looking at what could cause these population declines but specifically in the context of developmental deformities and looking at etiologies or causes for that and trying to unravel that but also trying to take locals along on public field trips, on eco-actions to help me look for the frogs and help them kind of be aware of what's happening, again, with populations of organisms living in proximity to them. During those years, I learned how to do this process called clearing and staining. And so clearing and staining is a, is a chemical process by which you 
um, use a series of enzymes which masticate the specimen and a series of stains which adhere to specific tissue like bone and cartilage. So blue is cartilage, red is calcified tissue. Then I started scanning these cleared and stained specimens. And then basically you get something that looks like a three-dimensional x-ray. So I was quite drawn to that uh, from the aesthetic perspective as an artist, but also I was very drawn to that as a scientist because that could help me further understand what was going on with those developmental deformities. It's around 42 to 43 percent of the global amphibian um, populations have disappeared really since the 1970s. I mean, I think as human beings, we're just not hardwired to understand how extinction works. I don't think we even understand or kind of normally can accept individual death. I mean, think about how abstract it is and how emotional it is when you lose someone close to you or the idea of yourself disappearing, let alone the idea of a species that's been here for so long, entirely gone. It's a really abstract concept for us to wrap our heads around. So I tried to think years ago how I could depict this. So initially what I started doing is I'd collect um, images or old field guides that had passenger pigeons in them. And I think out of just frustration at one point, I just kind of cut an image out and held it up to the light and it just kind of dawned on me. I'm like, wow, that's it. That's absence. I started in the Americas. I started in North America. So the initial ones were Audubon, but then they moved on. What that means is doing research on when the species disappeared as far as we know and keeping kind of an ongoing database, uh, looking for artists that depicted them, and then looking for artifacts that were created at that moment in history. And then once I've cut out the, the animals, I burn the images. And there's a video so you can see that called Death Makes Angels of Us All. And so it's burning the depictions of the animals, keeping the ashes, and then putting them in etched funerary urns and asking people to scatter those ashes. Because it, this, to me, makes the, the works more about a, I wouldn't even say performative, what I would say is transformative. And so when individuals scatter those ashes, it's really a connection to this abstraction, this lost species. Somehow there's something physical that you're letting go of. And if you've ever, um, you know, scattered someone's, cremated someone and scattered their ashes, it, it changes you. And, and, and that's hopefully, by connecting people to that loss, it hopefully makes us a little more aware of what's at stake. So we know that there are many, many different species in the Gulf of Mexico that are just super exploited. Bluefin tuna, for example, is pretty much commercially extinct. Um, and on and on, I mean, there's many of the kind of top level predators that have really been knocked off. And then to add insult on injury, I mean, there are just, you know, constantly small oil spills that happen in the Gulf of Mexico. But in 2010, we just had the largest one in, in U.S. history. And probably for global history, one of the largest oil spills ever, if not the largest. So collapse is my response to all of this. And what it represents is it's a sculptural sketch of the Gulf food chain. So at the bottom, you see kind of the base of the food chain. So you have uh, organisms that are detrivores, that are breaking things down and re-entering material into the food chain. And then you've got producers, which are you know, taking sunlight and then changing that into energy for other organisms to eat. And then it kind of works its way up to smaller fish and crustaceans. And so you finally get to alpha predators kind of towards the top. So it's a sketch of that, but it's not supposed to be a, a didactic display. It's a sculptural expression. It's a sketch. Um, it's, you know, it only represents a uh, little less than 2.4% of the known species in the Gulf, just to give you an idea. So if you imagine, if you had another 98 of those towers, you might have a sense of what's really living in the Gulf. And scattered, Throughout are these empty jars for missing species. And so the lab that I work in now, um, what, one of the things we're focusing on is some of those missing species. There are 77 endemic fish known to be in the Gulf of Mexico, um, 15 of which are missing since the, the 2010 spill. So it doesn't mean they're not there, we just haven't found them. So there's an effort now that we're trying to find them to make sure that they are still there. But through the art, I can speculate, and we were able to ask these questions and just continue this discussion about what the, the long-term impacts of the spill are on the Gulf. There's a lot of loss in the exhibition, and there's um, a lot of species changing in environments that are changing. Often when I'm, I'm creating new works, I like to do site-specific or place-based works, and that involves some of the species that are found here and some of the species in the, the vertebrate museum collection. So looking at uh, 
some of the wonderful birds that were there. And one of the collections that just really astounded me were these little sap suckers. What these are, are their skins. So they're not taxidermy, they're dried skins that were being utilized as a, as a study uh, in the West to look at the way sap suckers hybridize. So two different species that came together, created a hybrid, and then how that hybrid offspring would then rehybridize with the parental species and then mix with another hybrid and how this is kind of diversifying. And this is perfect, because it really talks about Charles Darwin's theory of the way that evolution branches out. So what these, these birds are doing literally is working, they're adapting to become something new. It's beautiful to see this, this moment in evolutionary or adaptive history captured. And then I, I place them in a way where they're laid out like stars growing and moving in different ways. So in other words, you have an individual that mixes with another individual, those offspring then become a new star. And it's just uh, beautiful to think of the way that life persists and is constantly changing like this. And that room also is kind of the evolution room where with Nove uh, are these portraits of Charles Darwin's pigeons. So in 2003, I had the opportunity to make portraits of these birds. We always think about Darwin's finches. Darwin's finches are considered really kind of their almost celebrity status, but what's often forgotten about is in Origin of Species, the first chapter is dedicated to Charles Darwin's pigeon breeding experiments. So what he did is he essentially bought all these fancy pigeons from North Africa, other parts of Europe, North America, and then he mixed them all together in these pigeon coops. So just through selective breeding, he would breed the equivalent to something like taking a, I don't know, an English bulldog and a corgi, mixing those breeds together and then cataloging what the puppies would look like. So he was doing that with the pigeons. But I mean, at the time it was kind of heresy, but what he theorized is that they were basically all descendants of the wild rock dove, which turned out genetically later, that's true. There are a few pieces in the exhibition where hopefully when people see it, they're emotionally responding to that loss, but there's stories of celebration too. There's actually a piece called Hope, which is a new site-specific installation, which are a collection of raptor wings. And it's referring to um, raptor populations that since the 1960s, 1950s, 60s, and 70s have increased. So even though we, we know all over the world we're in the middle of this mass extinction event and species are disappearing really, really quickly, there's great examples of species that are coming back because of the efforts oftentimes of just a handful of people. And there's so much more kind of effort collectively and across the world to try to slow this down. When people see the exhibition, they have this feeling too where there's this challenge of a landscape that's changing and also this, this sense of what do we do about it? You know, what can we do about it? And that's what I hope people walk away with.